Please welcome Bill for his second lecture. Thank you. So I'm going to continue um, discussing the theory of geometric structures on manifolds. And I'd like to give several more examples of, of structures, and some of these are going to be more exotic structures that don't really have, um, that aren't really modeled on metric spaces, but embody different kinds of geometry. So remember from yesterday that this is a way of uniting the subjects of topology and geometry. So while geometry concentrates on more quantitative measurements and relationships between points and other geometric entities, topology is concerned with just a loose organization of points. So yesterday we talked about two surfaces, or several surfaces, but we, in particular the two-sphere and the plane and the two-dimensional torus. And <clears throat> asked about when we could put Euclidean geometry on these spaces. And we also discussed a little bit about um, spherical geometry as well. So let me say a little bit more about what I mean by a geometry. And the um, subject of Euclidean geometry discusses points. Given two points, there's a line segment between them. The line segment between them is the path of shortest distance, and we have a notion of distance between the points. So if we have points P and Q, we know how to define the distance between them. That makes it into a metric space. Similarly, spherical geometry is the geometry that one experiences if we live on the surface of a sphere, and <clears throat> for that we have, say, two points P and Q. We want to look at the distance as we would measure it if we lived on the sphere. So that doesn't mean we just take the distance between P and Q in Euclidean space, that is the length of the chord between them, because the chord doesn't live on the sphere. Instead, we want to look at paths that lie on the surface of the sphere and compute the distance there. The shortest distance between two points P and Q is the arc of the great circle joining P and Q. So, if we look at the sphere in three space, which maybe we aren't really permitted to do if we live on it, but if, we're, if we imagine in a three-dimensional space, and this is how we do it, calculate most easily. P and Q represent the unit vectors in R3, and the distance between them is the angle between the two unit vectors. Okay, so that's the notion of spherical distance. The angle between two great circles is just the angle between their tangent lines. We have a notion of angle. We also have a notion of area, and so forth. So as I mentioned last time, we can have rather um, strange situations in spherical geometry. For example, by cutting the sphere by the three coordinate planes, we get three great circles and a triangle that has three right angles, which is impossible in Euclidean geometry because the angle is solid. So the geometries are, are Euclidean spherical geometry are all um, well-developed subjects that we can um, make statements and prove theorems and test examples in. There really are quite a few notions in the geometry. We have a notion of distance. 
straight line, which is the notion of a geodesic. We have a notion of what it means to be parallel. I'll say a little more about that later. And notions of area, volume, etc. Um, there are other interesting geometries that we might study. For example, we can look at the um, geometry of study where we are interested not just in um, metric relations, but just notions of incidence and lines. Suppose we just have a notion of point in a straight line, then one can prove theorems that don't involve these more refined measurements, like distance. <coughs> so a good example is Pappas' theorem. <coughs> It just deals with relationships between points and lines. So Pappas' theorem is the following. Let's choose two lines and choose a triple of points on each of these three lines, these two lines. And now let's join them up. So, so we will think of the points as being ordered. One, two, and three. One, two. And let's join a point, a brown point with a green point, if the labels are different. So we'll join point one and two, <coughs> and point two and one. But we won't join points one and one. We'll join point two to three, three to two, and one and three. And now we look at the corresponding intersections. So let's look at pair one and two. So we have this line here and this line here, and they intersect in this point here. So this is the point, the one, two point. Um, let's look at the one, three point. So one and, one and three are joined here and here. So we have another point, the one three point. Do that right. And now what about the two, three? So two and three are joined along this line, along this line here. And if I drew this picture better, these three points all lie on a straight line. It doesn't look that way from this picture, but I didn't draw this accurately enough. So this is an example of a theorem in projective geometry. The statement of the theorem in, doesn't involve any metric notions at all, just notions of um, incidence between points and lines. So involves incidents, which <coughs> we can talk about three points lying on the same line, that's collinearity, and three points lying, three lines going through the same point, that's concurrence. Yes? Yes, in a hyperbolic space too. So there's another geometry too, which is, I'll say a little bit more about tomorrow, hyperbolic geometry. And the projective geometry of all three of those spaces is the same. So if we drop notions of distance and angle and parallelism, we obtain projective geometry, which is a larger geometry. It's in some sense looser. Well, what else do we have in Euclidean geometry? We also have a notion of circle. And a circle is defined metrically. 
but we could also take that as a primitive object as well. And so we have theorems that would just involve circles and angles. So one theorem might be if you take three circles, like so, then there is always going to be a common orthogonal circle that meets the, the right angle. This just involves a notion of circle as a primitive object and a notion of angle. So this is an example of um, another weaker geometry called conformal geometry. In conformal geometry, we would have the notions of angle and the notion of And in fact, one can derive the properties of circles from characterized circles purely in terms of angle. We can mix these geometries, too, to have a notion of, so let's take the theorem that I mentioned yesterday, that if we have a triangle, the sum of the angles in the triangle is 180 degrees. This involves notions of angle and parallel but it doesn't involve a notion of distance. And you can see that if you take a, um, if you take this picture and you scale it, you magnify everything by two, so just say, imagine the origin being here and then take this picture and expand it by two, you get an equivalent picture that has the same, the same properties as long as you don't talk about distance. The distances are all doubled. And so this would be an example of conformal and parallel geometry, which we might call similarity geometry. Here we have notions of <coughs> straight lines and parallel. But in the notion of an angle. And we can think of the and we, and we can think of a straight line as being what you get by taking circles of larger and larger radius. In the limit, you get a straight line. OK, so projective geometry is pretty old. Pampas was around 800 AD, I think. And then there was a resurgence in the Renaissance through Dessart's was one of the first practitioners of projective geometry. And he was an architect and he was interested in studying perspective. So you imagine properties that you might see when you try to paint a picture on a canvas. And if you imagine looking at something and then projecting it onto a plane, then that the different projections on a plane will distort distances. And it, won't, it doesn't even preserve the notion of parallelism. If you imagine, if you're, say, in an airplane and you're looking at, say, two parallel lines like, the, like railroad tracks, it looks from certain perspectives that the two lines are going to be converging at infinity. And so the sort of theory of perspective led to the development of projective geometry. <coughs> and as you can see, there are lots of different geometries where you take certain geometric notions and forget about them. And they're well-defined subjects. And by the um, beginning of the 19th century, it was a little hard to keep track of all the different geometries. <coughs> These were unified by um, Felix Klein in the 18, I forget the date, 1840s, in a lecture in Erlangen, Germany, and this was 
his approach was called the Air Longer Program, and he um, interpreted geometries in terms of symmetries. So Euclidean geometry is defined as all properties of Euclidean space which are invariant under the group of Euclidean isometries. So we have groups of transformations which preserve a geometry, and he said, start with that. And then the geometry is everything that's preserved by that. So if you have Euclidean isometries, they preserve all of these, quant these quantities, point, distances, angles, area, and so forth. Projective transformations, which you get by tilting a plane, and I'll give examples later, will be um, given by a larger group of transformations which preserve less structure. And so this is one way of defining the notion of a geometry, a classical geometry in this sense. So for example, conformal geometry can be understood as follows. We take the complex numbers, which we can think of as pairs of real numbers, the complex number has a real and imaginary part. And then the transformations, we take a point, take the complex numbers and add on a point at infinity. And then a transformation, a linear fractional transformation, quotient of two linear transformations, where A, B, C, and D are complex numbers, will be a transformation that preserves angles and circles. So one of the simplest examples of something that's not a Euclidean isometry but still is conformal is inversion. So you take a complex number and you map it, or a vector, and you divide it by its some length squared. So that means you take a, a point and then you flip it in the circle and the distance to the origin now is replaced by it's reciprocal. So in particular, all the points on the unit circle are fixed. And it takes the inside to the outside. The, point, the origin is taken to the point at infinity, and the point at infinity is mapped to the origin. And it's an interesting exercise to show that if you have two directions at a point, then at the inverse point, the angles are the same. And the circle is reflected into a circle. However, the notion of the center of the circle is not preserved. That in general, this will distort the notion of center and radius. But the notion of angles will be preserved. So this leads to a very general construction of what a geometry should be. It's a it's a, it's a space that, upon which there's a group of transformations which is transitive. That means given any points P and Q, there's some transformation taking one point to the other. So this is the general context for what I was talking about yesterday for defining a geometric structure on the map. So we have geometry over here, which is given by called a homogeneous space. Which is a group of transform which is a space that has a group of transformations preserving some kind of structure. Okay, so that's the general context. I'd like to give some more examples that I wanted to at least put this into a into, into a general frame. So remember how we <coughs> thought about it yesterday. Every point in a topology has a system of open neighborhoods. And we take a small enough open neighborhood, a coordinate patch, and we map this into the geometry. So over here, we just have topology. Here we have 
some geometry, and we have distance or angle or arcs of circles or lots of different things we can talk about. And this defines, at least for nearby points, the local geometry on the space. Okay. Now, if we go from one point to a point, some points may have more than one description. And the points that um, have both a white description and a purple description are in this green region. And the green region will be mapped over here to the geometry and over here under this coordinate chart. And we want to require that the, um, there's a transformation in our group, in this case an isometry, which is what we were discussing yesterday, that takes this region here to this region here. So all the local geometry is preserved. And we saw yesterday that if we have a group of isom if this is if the um, transformations are all isometries, then this a Euclidean structure or a spherical structure lets us define this a um, metric, even when the Euclidean or spherical geometry is only locally defined. And so a familiar theorem, which I think is the good way of starting to think about it, is that the two-sphere has no Euclidean structure. That's just saying that there's no metrically accurate world atlas. But we did see yesterday that the torus does. So the torus. So you say there's a torus in here? The model. Will you grab it? So this is the, the abstract surface of the torus. It was drawn pictures of. This, is the, this torus, though, is, we're thinking of it as a subset of R3. That's, that's where we think that we live in. But the embedding in R3 isn't really used in this discussion. It's just the abstract collection of points. So the embedding in R3 isn't relevant. It's just what it's like to live on this on a surface. And so we could decompose the torus along two curves. One curve here and another curve here. We could get a um, rectangle, quadrilateral, with the sides identified in the convenient notation is to use arrows to say that this edge here is identified with this edge, and this edge is identified with this edge. That's the topology. Then we realized this as a quadrilateral, as a parallelogram, and the identifications are realized by isometries. That now puts the geometry on this abstract torus. Well, there are other ways of building this, too, of building geometric spaces as well. So here's a more complicated example. Let's start with a rectangle and identify the sides in different ways. So rather than identify the um, by just a parallel translation, let's identify this with a parallel translation combined with a reflection. This is called a glide reflection. So in terms of coordinates on the plane, that takes a point with coordinates x and y. Well, we, let's translate one, dis, one unit in the x-coordinate. And then let's flip in the y direction. So here's the, here's the x-axis. So a point above the x-axis, that is where y is positive, is going to be taken to a point below the x-axis. And for the moment, let's just take this identification. Then do we get a surface out of this? And what does the surface look like? Mobius strip. Right. So this is a Mobius strip. This is, you just think of taking a piece of paper and then identifying two opposite edges with a twist. So if we were to embed this in R3, you might have a picture like this. Here's the twist, and then we identify it with that. 
the surface has some interesting properties. It's not orientable. So if you imagine somebody that lives on the surface, and say, think of this person as having right hand and left hand, and if it's right handed, and you walk around the surface, as you go to the other side, as you pass the twist, the right hand becomes the left hand, and the left hand becomes the right hand. So the, the orientation is changed as you wander around it, this curve. Another way of saying it also, of saying, saying this, which is closely related, is that the surface is one-sided. So if you take a, a normal vector to the surface, say the points out of the blackboard, once you come over here and twist it, that normal vector is going to be pointing into the blackboard. Follow it around here, and you get the opposite of the original vector. Okay. Now we can be we can go a bit further. We can take this side here and identify it to this side here. Now, what does that look like down here? Because now the top and the bottom are identified. So when, you, when we first do the, the first identification, we get this surface here that just has one component to its boundary. But we could still, we could have actually started by doing this top and bottom identification to get an annulus. So that would look like, what would that look like? That would have a curve. We'll draw like that. And then we identify the inner curve here the outer curve, but now with the opposite orientation. It's hard to do in three space, but it's possible to do in your imagination. Okay. So this gives an interesting surface, which now has no boundary, and is compact, and that's the Klein bottle. It's the, the same Klein that developed the airline. And so this is another example. Now, do, do these transformations, so this gives rise to a surface. The same argument applies that we gave yesterday. So yesterday we went in great detail as to what the points on the surface look like. A point that lies in the interior of the rectangle has a coordinate system coming from being in the interior of the rectangle. A point that lies on the interior of a boundary, this point here is going to have a partner down here, and the two neighborhood of two half disk neighborhoods of this point, but these two points will glue together to give a full disk neighborhood. And then finally, points that are on the corner points have quarter disk neighborhoods. all glue together to give a um, full disk neighborhood. So this has a Euclidean structure. But it's missing one piece of the geometry that the torus and the preceding examples have, and that's orientation. So there's another geometry, which is oriented Euclidean geometry, which the Klein bottle doesn't have, but the torus did. And it's because there are transformations like this glide reflection that preserve distance but reverse orientation. So already this is, you can see that the subject gets rather interesting. And This arose in physics in the 19th century, where one was interested in finding um, crystals to model. So these are solids that have a lot of symmetry. And one could imagine three-dimensional versions of the torus, where one would take a cube and identify top to the bottom and then the opposite faces 
just by translations, this gives rise to a three-dimensional torus. But you can do quite a few other things, like identify to the top to the bottom by, say, when you go from the top to the bottom, you rotate around 180 degrees and use that identification rather than just a straight parallel translation. And in fact, you could do that in all three of the pairs of faces to get rather complicated examples. And there's like 17 different such crystals in three dimensions, whereas maybe only two, the torus and the Klein bottle. So this is the subject of crystal graphic groups. And maybe I'll just mention that any theorem, which I'm not going to prove, but this is discussed in Ratcliffe's book. It's a theorem due to Bieberbach. I think the date is 1912. That every close that is compact without boundary Euclidean manifold well let me I'll say what I'll explain what this means is a quotient of a torus so we think of a torus as being you take a parallel of hyphen so we can think of the, we can think of this the identifications as generating a group so we have a lattice integer translations in Z, in the integer translations in R3, sitting inside all the translations. <coughs> torus by quotient of torus. Oh, this is a lattice by a finite group translation. So let me explain what I mean by that. This, this was something that I, I illustrated this yesterday in my talk in the billiards, where you have a square and the billiard trajectories are bouncing off the sides of the square, that we can unwrap the square by taking, thinking of instead of bouncing off the side, let it go to a neighboring square. So we unwrap the square by taking four copies of it. One you get by flipping it over here. So this is putting, recording the, this, this new square, which will have will be four times larger, will have, it's like this square with a memory. We remember the last edge that it crossed. So when we go, when we bounce off the side, we remember that we bounced off this side and we enter the square here. We keep going, and eventually we cross this side and bounce down here. Well, that's going to correspond to going into this square here. So we, we remember the, sequ the last few terms, the last few edges that we bounced off of. So we bounced off of this one and this one, which means we enter this region here. But in this model, we just keep going. And we keep going further until we bounce off of this side. And now we enter this side here, which is going to be identified by the translation that we discussed yesterday to this side here, so that the billiards on the square are replaced by motion along a straight line on the torus. So that's, that's the idea. The Klein bottle, that's another example of this phenomenon. Now we go along the Klein bottle, and then when we cross this side here, where we've changed orientation, Let's just think of it as keep, we keep going. So we take this fundamental rectangle. You can just do that with a Mobius band if that's easier to visualize. But now, instead of identifying, we keep, keep track of the fact that we're on the, that we've changed the orientation and we go on here. The composition of the, this live reflection with itself, when we, we apply this transformation once more, x gets translated by 1 a further time, so it's x plus 2. But minus y is taken to minus minus y, so that's just translation by 2. And we get an annulus. Just strip 
that's twice as long, where the two edges are identified by a translation. Have you seen this before? Have you ever made a Mobius band out of a strip of paper? And then cut the paper along the, the inside? That's exactly what we're doing here. So that when we cut it along here, that's like taking the original fundamental rectangle. And instead of what if, instead of doubling it like I said here, which is an example of what's called a covering space, we get something equivalent by take by replacing it by two rectangles instead of stringing them one across the other. Now we've put one on top of the other. And now this side here is being identified to this side here. So pick up this picture here and put it over here to the right. So we're wandering around. See, so how do we do this? If we go along here, we come back over to here. Then we cross this side here. And this is going to be identified to this side here. So if we're allowed to pick up these two components, this picture of the rectangle that's twice as long with parallel identifications is equivalent to the Mobius band slid along one side. And now, to get back to the original Mobius band, <coughs> of <coughs> identifying, we have an annulus, a strip of paper, and that's what I was describing here. And now we identify by that transformation, which is given by this reflection in the middle, to go, together with the translation along one side. And that's going to be this finite group. In this case, it's a group just a quarter two, that goes from the annulus, which is Rn2 R2 modulo, a cyclic group of translations by a larger group. So that's one example. Are there any questions? I'm not sure how much of this, is, how much background. I've been assuming here. But... OK, so this is, this is an example of a classification and one of the basic theorems in the, in the subject, that one can reduce the study of Euclidean structures on manifold to studying lattices of translations and finite groups of symmetries. Okay, so that's the first class of examples I want to discuss. Okay, so I'm running out of time, but let me begin the next discussion. And I'll pick this up tomorrow because this, I think, is quite interesting. So in Euclidean geometry, you have notions of metric, straight line, parallel. You can talk about moving along a curve. The curve has a velocity vector. And then we measure the size of the velocity vector, and that's the, the speed. And if we have a curve that's going in the same direction at constant speed, that's going to be a geodesic. So it's not turning, and it's going at constant speed. So the rate of change of the velocity, the derivative of the velocity, is the acceleration. And saying that the curve has no acceleration means that the curve is just moving along so that the velocity is parallel to itself. So this is an example where the velocity is not parallel to itself. If you go from this point to this point, <coughs> you parallel translate this vector here, it's going to be up here rather than where it is. So it's turned. The curve 
has been accelerating. Even if it's going at constant speed, the direction will represent a change in a non-zero acceleration. The acceleration would be pointing in the direction that it's turning in. Well, an inter interesting geometry, and I alluded to this earlier, is obtained by dropping the notions of metric, but retaining the notion of parallel. And this is called Athens. And in fact, if you take any linear transformation at all, so take a point in the plane and do what I said before, just double two coordinates, that certainly distorts distance. It, d it doubles the distance between two points. But it does keep the notion of parallelism intact. And we can define geometric <coughs> manifolds that have structures with the notion of parallelism that are quite different than the Euclidean notion that we had. So on the torus that we described yesterday, where we identified the sides of the parallelogram, we had a notion of parallelism and distance that was just like Euclidean geometry. But in the remaining time, I'd like to describe an example where the notion of zero acceleration looks much, much different than anything that we've expected before. So this is an example, which is due to Heinz Hopf in the 1940s, I believe. So, so this is a transformation that takes a point and doubles it. So let's observe that it takes a sphere or a circle of radius one to a circle of radius two. Let's identify the inner circle, the blue circle, with the green circle, the outer circle, by this map. Okay, so what do we have? This region here, that I'll put color in yellow, is an annulus. So we have a yellow annulus with one green boundary, say the top, and one blue boundary at the bottom. And we'll identify these two. boundaries to get a torus. So we have, a, again, now we have a torus. This is a simpler identification space because there's only one identification. But the region that we started with is more complicated. So here's the um, picture. And we can do a little reality check. If we have a point that's not on the boundary, then it has a coordinate chart that just maps in by the embedding of the annulus in the plane, and that has a nice neighborhood. But then a point on the curve will have two pieces, one on one side of the blue curve, and the blue curve is identified to the green curve, so this point here has a partner up here, which has a half-disc neighbor right here, and then by applying this transformation, this multiplication by two, or its inverse, which is multiplication by one half, brings down, bring this half disk neighborhood down here to a full disk neighborhood on the other side. And that corresponds to this region here. Okay, so now we have a new description of the surface. It's, again, it's a torus. This is topology. We're just describing it as a points that are organized this way. And now we're realizing it geometrically as this annulus, the region of, of, of consisting of, point, of vectors whose length is between 1 and 2. 
with this identification given by this transformation here that preserves parallelism, preserves straight line. Okay. Now we have a notion of a geodesic. So even though the, there's no notion of, of distance, the, um, the geodesics in Euclidean space are curves that are motions along straight lines at constant speed. So they're moving along a straight line, so they're not turning. <coughs> so that means that the acceleration is all tangential. And we're assuming the, con the speed is constant, which means that the, that acceleration is actually zero. So talking about a geodesic that is a curve of zero acceleration doesn't involve any metric notions. It just involves the notion of being parallel. It means that this doesn't happen. It means that as you move along the curve, the velocity vectors are all obtained by parallel translation to each other. From each other. Now, this surface is a little problematic then. Because if you think about it, if you have a notion of if you have a surface that has Euclidean geometry on it, and you're going along constant speed, and the surface is compact, you keep moving along. This is very tame, moving along. And if you, since the surface is compact, every sequence has an accumulation point. So if you get to a hole, you have a, if you, if you, if you're up to time t, then by taking the limit as you approach that time, you can extend the geodesic. So the, these paths of zero acceleration are always complete. They can always be extended if you're on, on a surface that's closed. Okay. And so this is, this is a, a famous theorem called the Hoffman-Greenau theorem. It's the same, the same Hoffman. And so if you're traveling around on this the surface, then you can always extend the geodesic. You aim in a certain direction and just follow it along. And because there aren't any holes in the surface, any missing points, you can continue. And this is the same notion of completeness as in the, the completeness of the, in the metric space. As you, if you're following a geodesic up to a certain point, you get a sequence that are getting closer and closer together. That's a Cauchy sequence, and that Cauchy sequence converges. Okay, here you don't have a notion of distance, but we still have this notion of parallelism and acceleration. So imagine what would happen if you started at some point way out here, and you aimed right at the origin. And then follow going, follow that curve along the geodesic, there's a straight line going at zero acceleration at constant speed. Now the speed at which you're going at is constant, but as you go into here, it's changed because we've applied this transformation that multiplies by two or one half. So the speed being, we can talk about the speed being constant by sort of cheating, but we don't know what that constant is because that value is not preserved by this transformation. So imagine that it takes one second to get from this point to this point. Now they're actually the same point because they're identified, so that means we're going around this curve here. And it takes one second to do that. Up here in the space, that's going to here. And then we bounce back over to here by the identification. We've, we've crossed over here. And now we get to the next tile in our next fundamental domain. How long does it take to get from here to go around the second time. It takes half the time. Because here, we're going, in Euclidean space, we're just going at zero acceleration at that constant speed, but the distance is, is half. So that means that the second time that we go around, it only takes half a second. I'll keep going. 
now we get into this region that's now it's one quarter the size, and it only takes one fourth of a second. So as you keep going around this curve at zero acceleration, that is a constant speed as measured by this geometric structure, that's your well, the amount of time that it takes to keep going is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. And what happens in 2 seconds, if you're measuring it by some metric on this surface, then the sequence diverges. So we have an infinite sequence now which does not, which just goes off the manifold. So this is an example of something which is well, geodesically incomplete. And even though it's occurring on this compact, bounded, closed surface, the geodesic is not continuing forever. This sequence is, you know, well, we don't have a metric, so we can't talk about the surface being a Cauchy sequence and, and it's converging. So this is a, a very simple example, in a way, where we do have a notion of parallelism, a notion of acceleration, a notion of straight line, but it's completely different than if we were working inside more familiar geometry in which there's a metric. Okay, so this is, I think this is a fascinating example, and it um, shows the richness of these um, geometric structures that, are, that don't involve metric notions. Okay, so I think I'll stop, stop here right now. So, so tomorrow I'll go back to some metric notions and talk about non-Euclidean hyperbolic geometry. I'll try to relate some of these examples I've talked about today.